One of the emerging themes has been hardware manufacturing and the complexity of it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Danielle's presentation. Okay. Without further ado. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Applestone, CEO and co-founder of Other Machine Company. We are a company that builds desktop sized tools for manufacturing. So what I mean by that is high precision cutting of 3D objects out of durable materials like aluminum and wood and circuit board. You just put a block in there and turn it on and it will cut a 3D shape for you. So kind of opposite of 3D printing, but I think an extension of what people should be able to do on their desktops. Um, I'll show you a quick, this is the quickest way to, oh, mute, definitely mute. The quickest way to see what the other mill does, this is it cutting a fab ISP board, of course, sped up, but it just uses a rapidly rotating sharp cutting tool uh, that you use a computer to control. So, ta-da, fab ISP for you. Um, so, <clears throat> against all urgings of everyone I know, this is how you do, this is a live demo, this is how you program this machine. So this is Inkscape, it's free, it's like Illustrator. So you could say, hey, I want to type something. How about I want to type the future? Type the future. Um, and so then you can just make it too small. Okay, and save this. Turn that text into a path and then save as don't ever do a live demo dot SVG. It's just a vector file, replace. And then this, this is the fun part. So this is, this is also part of what we do. So we build this machine and then we write software that looks just like the machine, just in case you were mixed up about what you should plug into your computer. It looks just like it. So this is other plan. It gives you a 3D view. And so if what you see on your screen is what matches real life, you're good to go. So you can choose different materials, and it sets speeds and feeds for you. And then you can just import a vector file, if that's what you've designed. And it does all the path planning and chooses tools for you. And so then you can just press go. And so this world of manufacturing, which is usually hidden inside factories, is now accessible to people. And that really points to more of you know, why we do what we do, which is we think that it's a good idea to have people be able to have access to these tools and invent new things um, because nobody really understands your community better than you do, so why shouldn't you have the tools to solve those issues? And we've had machines out there in the world for about 18 months, and this is just like the very smallest selection of what people have made with them. So. Of course, people are doing electronics. Um, instead of sending their files away to board houses, they'll just make the things at home and iterate really rapidly, and aluminum parts, and there's like book binding in the middle, and typesetting, and engraving, and, and you know, of course, making aluminum brackets for things. And for us, this is like, this is what happens when you put an easy to use tool out there for people. Uh, they just start creating things. Um, and I think this is similar to what happened with 3D printing, but now it's, it's all the other materials like metal and wood and things like that. Um, and this to me is like the pinnacle of why we do what we do, which is, uh, so this was made by one of our, it's an ice fishing rig, if that wasn't obvious. Um, but it's not just any ice fishing rig. It was uh, designed by this community member, uh, Jetty is his name. He's in Calgary. The tent in the back is where he's hanging out. But this ice fishing rig, whenever he gets a bite, this is 3D printed, by the way, 3D printed. Whenever he gets a bite, it vibrates. And it vibrates this, which he has taped together to his chest. And it lets him know when he's got a bite. So he's like inside his hut, feeling very cozy, sipping on whatever. And, uh, and not only is it great because he gets to stay warm, but he goes out and he can release the fish immediately, which drastically increases the rate of survival for any fish he doesn't want. So, oh, and then he can put more bait and put it back out there. And so he gets more like time in water with fresh bait. Plus, oh, hi, Sam. Uh, plus, 
the fish get to survive more often, which I think is great. And this is a person that's like, all right, he's in the middle of Calgary in Canada, and he has a 3D printer, and he has another mill so he can make circuits, and he can, can design something that I don't need in my life. And probably many of us don't really need this device in our life, but who's to say that this device, this, this device shouldn't exist? Um, so that's really what we're trying to do here is like, all these people who have ideas, give them the right kind of tools. So that's like the what we do and the why we do it. But really, this talk is about the how. How do we make this other mill? So we build this other mill. This is a clear one. So you can literally see all of the 227 parts. Uh, you can come check it out in the maker shed. That's where it'll be after this. Um, this one's made out of plexiglass. Uh, we build this machine using like 99, no, not 99. Shh. 89% domestic manufacturing. So people make the components in the Bay Area for the most part, and then we do final assembly here. And the whole reason I want to do this talk in general is that I want to squash the notion that uh, manufacturing, domestic manufacturing, or local manufacturing is dead, because it, it isn't. Um, so this is where we build the machine. So this is final assembly. This is an old pipe organ factory in San Francisco. Uh, in the mission, this is the building that we now occupy. So we do batches of machines there, and this is what it looks like, a, a batch of other mills in progress. So we've kind of taken an old pipe organ factory that was designed to, the whole building was specifically designed to build pipe organs, and we retrofitted it to build these desktop machines. Um, we also do sub-assembly and incoming quality control. The quality control part is a theme you'll hear throughout what I'm talking about. Um, so these are Z-block and, and spindle assemblies that we've assembled in-house from parts made by other people out of house. So I like to think about the other mill as an organism with different body systems. So it has the skeleton, which is the outside. It has the motors, which I think of as like the heart, you know, circulating the, the motion of the machine, and a nervous system, which is all the electrical and the motor controller, and the muscle, which is like the big aluminum parts that hold things steady. Um, so the first part I want to talk about is the heart of the other mill, the motors. Our motors are made by a place called Coco Motion. They're down in Morgan Hill. And Coco Motion, they have come up with this amazing thing. So, so in this picture, you can see these long, skinny things sticking up. Those are lead screws. So a lead screw is like a threaded rod, just like a screw you would screw into anywhere, into the wall. Um, but each, you know, for a, for a screw that you're using to control the motion of your machine, you want to have it be perfect. It has to be absolutely perfect because every thread and the distance between peaks of the thread needs to correspond to a certain amount of motion in a direction. And if those threads aren't accurate, then how do you know how far you've moved your, your um, you know, moved your, I guess this is a carriage, move the carriage back and forth. Um, so what they do is they take rods that have been ground, so a rod is just doesn't have any threads at all, they take the rods and then they use these. So these are dies, they're about this big a piece, and they have tiny slants, which are grooves, and so these two things are gonna roll together and put threads on every single rod. So what they do is they grind the rods in the United States, they ship them to Asia, then they are put together with all the rest of the motor uh, components and then shipped back to us. They go through quality control and then they're like shipped to our facility in San Francisco, which to me sounds crazy. Like, why wouldn't you just make them in, in at the same place that you do the whole motor assembly? And the, the issue is, the, is quality. So this is the crazy machine that, that they use. It's called a Kinefac. This is what puts the threads onto the rods, turning them into the lead screws that we use for our machine. And this is a little video of how it works. So it's just got a big splinting flywheel. One of the dies, those big round things I showed you, one is pointed up slightly and one is pointed down slightly. So it draws the rod into the machine and puts threads on it. The other thing that's fun to notice is the diameter of the rod is actually bigger when it comes out of this machine because the threads have been, it's basically you're squishing metal out into the threads and making it into a bigger rod. Um, which I just find fascinating. I think um, it's a great company. You should definitely work with them. All, by the way, all of this is a plug for our amazing partners, too, because um, without them, we would be 
nowhere. <laughs> so the skeleton of the other mill, the frame, this is the, the trickiest and weirdest part. So most machines that you see like this are cast metal or bent sheet metal or injection molded of some sort. Ours is not. Ours is sheets of plastic. So Piedmont Plastics is where we get our, um, where we get our high density polyethylene and that's what we usually use to make the frames. It's just milk jug plastic um, that we use to make the frames of the other mill. And I like to point out Piedmont because they don't make anything specialty for us. They don't make one of our parts, but what they do is they take giant sheets of plastic from industrial, like for industrial applications, and cut them down to a size that we can manage. And for a small manufacturer like us, this is really important because not only do we not have storage, but we don't have the ability to cut these uh, pieces down to size. So once we do have the sheets that are cut to the right size, we mill them into frames. And this is what that looks like. So this is a Haas machine, uh, an SR100, we use to cut all of the frames, and that's, that's all it is. You just take plastic and then you <laughs> use a giant milling machine to, to make the parts, and this is what it looks like. Um, after, so each, each piece of, I think it's like two by three HTPE gets milled into a frame. So I think there's one, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven pieces make up the frame of the other mill. And this is also cool to show people because it shows you, this is just 2D parts that you form up into the 3D object, which is the frame, which I always get a kick out of. Um, so the muscle of the machine is the high precision machined aluminum parts. So these parts are meant to be very rigid, stay in place, be exactly machined to the tolerances that we want. So we partner with a company called Bishop Weiss Carver. They've been around since 1950. They do all kinds of precision machining, and, and machining um, but they agreed to work with us because uh, they like what we're doing as well. Um, so this is, you know, loading up a piece of aluminum into a large milling machine and then I apologize, they wouldn't let us run, you know, take video with a door open. So this is uh, liquid cooling and, oh, nope, it's not, okay. So cutting one of the aluminum pieces, machining one of the aluminum pieces that goes into the Y bed and that's the place where you put your material that you wanna cut in the other mill. Awesome. I never, ever get tired of watching these machines, ever. <laughs> awesome, so that's one part. Um, and the, we'll talk a little bit about quality control. So every part that comes out of that machine is then hand-checked by a person really quickly uh, against these diagrams, which is, these are geometric dimension and, and tolerance diagrams. This is really important. This, like, just plain old sheets of paper, because this is the way that you communicate from the maker world, I've made a thing, I've designed a thing, to the rest of the world, which is the manufacturing world. Um, and so you have to learn that language, and th that's what this is. This is a diagram of what the parts are. Um, so after the initial, um, the initial quality control that the person does when they take it off the machine, they also take the parts to an automated QC facility, which is completely rad. So this table, this black table that you see, is a giant block of granite, absolutely um, perfectly calibrated to this machine. So they take each of the parts and they use a probe, like an automated test uh, testing sequence with a probe, to make sure that everything we think about the part is actually true. So that's two quality control steps. And then when these parts get to our house, we do another layer of quality control um, because quality, 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 quality. Absolutely matters and is worth it. So the, the next to last system is the nervous system. So wiring and electronics is another thing that you have to think about with the machine. And all these systems have to be designed together, which I think is fascinating. So we're, we work with Lima. It's an electronics manufacturing facility very close to here in Brisbane. Uh, it's been around since the 70s. It looks just like all the photos of China, but it's you know not even that far from here. Um, totally amazing facility. They do boards, they do wiring harnesses, all kinds of things. Um, this is one of my favorite machines there. It's a pick and place machine. It does remind me of a crab with like the weird mouth parts. Um, 
This is what goes into the pick and place. So these are circuit boards that already have solder paste deposited on them. So these are for surface mount components. So you have your board, then you have the solder, and then you put the components on and then heat it. And this is what the pick and place crab machine looks like. Moving very fast. So it's picking up very tiny components and placing them everywhere. And after that, the inspection is all done by computers. So they run all of the boards through this thing, and, all, and everything is like linear. So it's like raw boards come in, solder paste, pick and place, inspection, then you go on to everything else. But uh, so really sophisticated imaging systems that are then inspected by people. But, and this is a common theme through all the factories that we work with, there's always a hand fabrication Place. There's always one of the steps that just can't be done by a machine. Um, so I find that fascinating. But what you see everywhere in all of these diagrams, or all, all these images that I'm showing you, is there's a lot of machines. There's an awful lot of machines um, everywhere, and not as many people. Um, so packaging, you also have to get it to people's doorsteps safely. Uh, this is flexography, so it's like printing press, but it looks like jello, and it's really flexible and can print on a bunch of different uh, substrates. So you have, of course, the making of, of the, 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 like the letterpress part, and then you have the inking of it, and then the printing, and then there's also gluing and cutting. Um, so that's the whole pro that's a whole process. Those are all of the systems, and we did a whole one-day tour around the Bay Area and visited all those in one day. And so I always am wondering, like, why are people saying the manufacturing is dead? And I think it's because there weren't a lot of people in those photos. It was machines working side by side with people, and that's what I think is really key uh, to what the future of manufacturing is going to be on a local scale. Is really raising people up to not only learn hand skills in terms of making things, but also learn how to use a computer-controlled machine and have you learn as a child both of those skill sets um, because it's valuable. And I think that's actually the way that we can make the best use of the expertise that we have in the area um, is to keep, is actually to train a whole gener generation of people who understand how manufacturing is done. Um, and then just some examples. Of, of what people are doing and why desktop manufacturing is key. So you, when you have a small scale machine, instead of having one in those big factories like this one, you can make parts really fast. You don't have to interface with anyone else and you can learn the language of manufacturing um, in-house. So this was some aluminum parts that were made for a 3D, uh, 3D printer head. And then there's also homegrown product design. You can invent entire new classes of wearables. Um, this is one that teaches you tempo over time. Uh, and then also you can have extremely high levels of customization still at a, a, like a cost competitive, well, you can make them cost competitive. So this is a person who made these modules and has this really intricate design on that that I guarantee you if this person was trying to get a factory to make them or make one or two, it would be super expensive. But if the person has the machine, they know how to use it, then they can actually make these devices um, and you know, sell them, figure out you know, if, if anyone else wants them, just tinker around until they've decided that they want to start a business or anything like that. Um, so to close, I think that the point is if we want to interact with the whole world and the whole world of manufacturing, we should take the expertise that we have been building over decades and decades and marry it with what the rest of the world is telling us, which is like, there's these machines that you need to learn how to use. And if you do both, if you have the craft and you have the machines, um, then you can fully participate and make amazing things for the future and the children. <laughs> That's all. That's my whole talk. Um, Questions? Five minutes and 53 seconds for questions. Sure. There's also a microphone, if that's easier. And thanks for waiting so patiently. I did see your hand. Thanks. Um, I know you were stressing a lot about the tolerances and all that about your um, CNC mill. And I kind of remember going through one of these um, websites where I believe one of your 
team members actually wrote about the entire process of developing the other mill. Mm -hmm. um, can you please go more into depth about like all the different prototypes they went through, the tablatures, <laughs> I believe, on the um, edges where you guys kind of had issues with that? Yeah. Well, uh, here's what I'll say to sort of summarize what you're, at, summarize what you're asking. Um, even just having one bearing, so say like on the front of the Y carriage, one bearing that isn't quite right, you're gonna have the, every time the machine moves, it's gonna grind against this bearing and everything is gonna be off. And these are like in the tens of thousandths of an inch, like it has to be absolutely exact or the machine will run but it'll either wear out or you won't get the kind of performance that you want. Everything won't be in the right place whenever you make cuts. So yeah, there's, it's kind of exhaustive to go through every single thing, but what I will say is that even for a machine that's like this, that's portable and you're supposed to throw it in your car, like every single piece matters and has to work together as a system and to be perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, how do you think your fabrication process will change as you scale up to 10x or 100x the uh, production volume? Um, well, one of the cool things about scaling up is you get to play with all these other kind of commodity scale manufacturing techniques. So you can imagine um, the, the milling process that we make our frame by is, takes a long time. Whereas if you knew that you were going to make 50,000 of exactly the same thing, you could do something like die casting. You could have your frame just be one die cast sort of bulk rough process and then do a post machining operation on it after that to get everything in line. And so for us, you know, maybe this this kind of design will last us until we're doing a hundred or doing ten thousand a year. But then what we get to do is, well, first of all, we'll have money in the bank. That'll be amazing. And then we can invest in 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 investigating all of these new techniques like that. Or injection molding or there's also compositing where it's like a foam core and then two layers of metal on either side, which is rigid and still lightweight. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely things like the frame would change with scale, but the other components are pretty scalable as they are. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask two questions? Sure. What's the biggest work piece is that you could put in there? Um, so about yay big, so five and a half inches by four and a half inches, and then 1.4 inches in the Z dimension. Oh, nice. Thank you. And the other one is... Let's say I don't want to buy one because I don't have that many ideas I want to try out. Is there a place I can go or send a file to and they would, it would just, you know, like a, like a user service? There's, a, there's actually a handful of machines. Well, if you're in the area, there's a handful of machines that are at local maker spaces um, that people, if people just want to try it out, use it a couple times. They also teach classes with the other mill. You could go and try it out. Thank you had a question? Oh, okay. Uh, as a student who is uh, definitely interested in like 3D printing and this kind of technology, uh, do you guys offer educational discounts, or are you like working with schools <laughs> to like get your uh, machine like to access like people that can learn about it? Yeah, totally. Just email us. Okay. <laughs> no, we work with a lot of schools. It's a big it's a big deal for us. And and for those of you who know who know something about our company, we were historically a government funded project. Um, it was a DARPA grant to, to build desktop size portable machines to put in the classroom. And so maintaining that view of what the world needs, um, we need more students using these machines. We work with education a lot. Uh, it's a big part of why we do what we do. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you.